Good morning, I'm Reverend Betsy Singleton Snyder and welcome to my car. This morning, on Friday morning, as we were get ready to record our worship service, I take my boys to school, take them every day. But on Fridays, if it's been a good week, we go to Starbucks and we get a little treat. Mommy's had her treat and I get a little coffee for me and um, it starts our day. And um, I'd already been walking, so that's another way to, good way to start your day. But also on Sundays, um, and as you're able during the week, you have an opportunity to worship with us uh, via Facebook, um, as well as online at winfieldumc.com. So we are glad you were here this morning. Let's keep to our routines, whether it's prayer, presence, service, witness, gifts, all of those are so important. Welcome, we're glad you're here.
morning. Welcome to Winfield United Methodist Church Online. I'm Jenny Thompson. I'm Nikki Ackerman. And I'm Kira Ackerman. I'm also part of the sewing group. I'm part of the praise team. I'm part of the praise team as well, along with being part of the audiovisual when we are in the building. At this time, we'd like to invite you to get a candle and light it with us. If you would like to follow along with the scripture at home, feel free to grab your Bible. If you want to follow along with the hymnals at, or the hymns at home, grab your hymnal. If you don't have one available, that's okay. The words will be print, printed on the bottom of the screen for you. And if you would, please go to winfieldumc.com and register for your attendance to make sure that uh, you have been seeing the, these amazing videos. And you can also sign up for Pastor Betsy's emails that are sent out weekly, or you can send prayer requests. Thank you for joining us today for the service. And we'd like to also say that as this week has progressed, that we remember our veterans and all those um, overseas who are celebrating Armistice Day. All hail the power of Jesus' name, verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. You'll see it also on the bottom of the screen.
Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Miss Kathy, and I'm wearing my extra special fun hat that Reverend Betsy gave me, and it inspired me to talk about nature today to you. So we're gonna see what God says about the green leaves and the trees. So here we go. This is in Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. God spoke, earth green up, grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants, every sort of fruit-bearing tree. And there it was. Earth produced green seed-bearing plants of all varieties and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. And God saw that it was good. Have any of you been raking leaves? I teach piano lessons and some of my students have been bragging about big piles of leaves and how beautiful they are and some are green still, but most of them are gold and yellow and red and purple, and they are absolutely beautiful. So, why do trees have leaves anyway? When God created the world, he separated the water from the dry land, created trees and other growing things, and the following day he created the sun and the moon. Trees had all they needed to grow and make new trees, soil, water, and sun. The leaves on the trees used the sunlight to change water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and to make glucose. Oxygen would be needed for the animals and the humans when they were created. And glucose provided energy for the trees to grow. This process, and here comes a big word, is known as photosynthesis. And chlorophyll is a chemical that helps it happen. Chlorophyll gives plants their green color. Look at the leaves that have fallen. Are they green? Most of them aren't. And this is part of God's plan too. The first day of summer is the longest day of the year and it has the most sunlight. As the season changes from summer into autumn, y'all have probably already noticed this, the days grow shorter and shorter. God created the trees to work with the sun about to lose my hat. And when the days offer less sunlight, the trees know it's time to get ready for winter. In winter, there isn't enough sun for photosynthesis. So that means the trees don't need their leaves to make glucose in the wintertime. Instead, they enjoy a time of rest and live off the energy they've already stored. When this happens, the supply of chlorophyll that makes the leaves, the leaves green stop, the leaves change colors like you've been raking. Autumn is a favorite season of many, and with its beautiful display of all these colors, we also have the Thanksgiving holiday. It also offers plenty of opportunities for us to thank God for the beauty of the earth and his plan for everything to work together and to keep our world a healthy place and a good place for everybody. Kids, let's pray. Put your hands together. God, thank you for our beautiful world and all living things that you have created. Help us to protect our world and to honor you because you have created so much for us. Lord, we love you. Amen. Hope you have a wonderful fall. Happy fall, y'all. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Jesus, you have called us to love all people as you yourself modeled love for us. It sounds easy enough, but day in and day out, we allow annoyance, anger, and even malice to take up space in our hearts. Lord, even though we don't like to admit it, we have enemies, or at least those we have made our enemies. Lord, reveal to us those for whom we still harbor anger or jealousy or even contempt. Forgive us, Lord, when we have not shown your church to be a home of reconciliation, a place of forgiveness, of humility, and most of all, love. By your grace, empower us as your disciples to take a posture of listening, care, and deep compassion for our world, our community, 
our families and friends. We pray in these moments silently. Especially this day, we pray for the family of Todd Batchelor, Paula DeBus Slater, and Molly DeBus, for Lawrence Bowman, and for Pat Ramirez. In the days ahead, Lord, guide us to cling tightly to your spirit, that empowered by your grace, we would all display radical grace and hospitality to all. In the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and brother, and who taught us to pray as he taught his first disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to a time of sharing our gifts. And I want us to understand that even though we are not meeting in person, our church is still very much open in some important ways. We're offering Zoom yoga. We did a S'mores Outdoors event, safely distanced last week. We are collecting food for the in gathering at the Arkansas Food Bank. We had an, a blessing of the animals last month and raised money for the Roland Crisis Closet Pet Ministry. We are doing active work in our community, but it takes all of us. I'm standing right now, as you may be able to see, I'm gonna go 365 in our fellowship hall. And some of you may not know about our fellowship hall. It's a beautiful place. It's a place we've done worship. It's a place we've shown music, um, movies. It's a place we have actually had lots of meals um, and we hope to share those again together in the future. But I want us um, to be expecting a, a pledge card to those of you who are members. If you're a guest and would like to make a contribution to the church in 2021, we would greatly appreciate it. Our card will be going out, though, to members this week. And our theme, as you might be able to tell, is light no matter what. Light no matter what. Because right now, we're keeping the lights on, and we're keeping our light on. We're shining a light in the darkness in the midst of COVID. Let us keep in prayer all of our friends, relatives, all of the churches around the country and world that are trying to bring relief and health and wholeness to the world. Please respond soon and let us know that you'll make a commitment in 2021 because we're going places with Jesus Christ. Now, let us pray. God, thank you for the gifts that you have given us and help us to be bold and courageous in our giving. And no matter what we give, whether it's $5 a month or 2,500 a month, no matter what, please know that we give this knowing it is from you, the giver of love and abundance. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you so much. We're glad you're here in worship. Thank you. 
Please stand with me for today's scripture reading, which comes from Genesis 4, verses 1 through 9. The man Adam knew his wife Eve intimately. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain and said, I have given life to a man with the Lord's help. She gave birth a second time to Cain's brother Abel. Abel cared for the flocks. Cain farmed the fertile land. Sometime later, Cain presented an offering to the Lord from the land's crops while Abel presented his flock's oldest offspring with their fat. The Lord looked favorably on Abel and his sacrifice, but didn't look favorably on Cain and his sacrifice. Cain became very angry and looked resentful. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry and why do you look so resentful? If you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do the right thing, sin will be waiting at the door, ready to strike. It will entice you, but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, either through me or in spite of me, speak the good news that we may all hear it, embrace it, and above all, live it. In the name of Jesus the Christ, the risen one, as I was driving my boys to school the other day, I was um, offering them an extra lesson from the news. I had been listening to an in-depth report on National Public Radio that morning, and the reporter was talking about the desire of a lot of Scots to leave the UK. In short, large numbers of Scots do not like Brexit, and they want their independence. Well, why do they want to leave England? my boys ask. I reminded them then of the two television series I binge watched, some of the early days of COVID, The Crown and The Outlander. I told them that both of those dramas had reminded me that there are downsides to being British colonies and not being fully independent. I said, you know, the Scots had their own individual clans and and a laird or a lord who oversaw them protected them, and to whom they were loyal. In fact, I said, you know, we came from Scottish-Irish ancestry. We, we come from the Campbells and the Singletons. You know, I think all of us Singletons on, on my side are a bit like a Scottish clan. We're loyal to one another, and we take up for one another, and we love to get together, and we love to talk, and sometimes we even have a dram together. <laughs> My three almost 12-year-olds said they had no interest in being together once they were grown. (laughs) Oh, I said, really? Well, just look at Uncle Tom and Uncle Steve, how they played and fought as boys, but but they love to see one another now, and, and they give one another a hard time, it's true, but they share those wonderful memories of growing up together. Finally, one of them said, nope, nope. I spent all this time with my brothers. And I don't plan on spending time with them when I'm grown. (laughs) I think maybe there might be a little COVID-19 talking. (laughs) Not having normal school with a lot of friends absent may play another part. I think they also have no way to understand that the people (laughs) with whom you are raised, yes, they get on your nerves, but they are some of the only people with whom you will share memories, especially for the long haul. And yet, I also know, yeah, I know there are families that are estranged out there. And they disagree, they fight, they're bitter, they carry grudges. Sometimes they they have even physically harmed another member of the family. Families are sometimes tough. Actually, Genesis tells that exact story, doesn't it? Our story as families. 
Genesis and, and much of the Bible, which gives us some great stories about how we humans are, who we are, how we act, how we behave, including the parts of us that, frankly, are woefully selfish, terribly destructive, fearful, even willing to hurt another human. Genesis chapter 4, which you heard Lonnie read a few moments ago, those early verses, the one uh, that tells us there were two brothers born to a couple, we call them the first couple, trying to figure out how to live in the real world and not in paradise. They've been booted out of paradise. And there are two brothers who come along to that couple, two brothers in one family. The other night, my husband said, you know, I'm beginning to see how very different our four children are. <laughs> really? <laughs> I expect any parent or even a teacher or a, a caregiver to, to any kind of child, even if it's not their child, they, they notice their differences, their attitudes, their moods, ways that they problem solve, temperaments, what soothes them or what upsets them, what makes them happy. Sometimes we tend to think of children or one another in stereotypes, too. Oh, he's the smart one. She's the creative one. He's the, the funny one. That first couple named their firstborn Cain, which, by the way, means spear. He would grow up to be a farmer. The secondborn... Abel, breath or wind, becomes a shepherd, someone who tends the flocks. We can already see that spear and breath foreshadow big differences, spear and breath. Through Genesis 4 doesn't offer the details of these two siblings growing up it doesn't give us um, any infighting. It doesn't give us uh, any history. It just portrays that relationships, human relationships, can go awry, terribly, terribly awry. First, I think we ought to notice two human beings, or maybe we could call them two groups, with unique differences can devolve into comparisons of anger, and resentment. The older one, also in this story, the one who has been around longer, the one with more experience, more time on earth, the one who is accustomed to being the focus, becomes sidelined with the appearance of a rival. And that's another part of the story. Another thing I noticed, rather than support the differences between the two and celebrate them, Wow, look at spear and look at breath. Humans sometimes want to kill them off, destroy the differences, especially if those differences represent some kind of special treatment, the way God seems to prefer, prefer Abel's offering to Cain's. And that is a big question in the story, isn't it? Why does God seem to prefer Abel's gift to, to Cain's? Why does God seem to prefer the meat to the grain? Loads of commentaries have been written about this passage. But maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe that's really not the right question. Maybe we need to give consideration in the story to what happens when we perceive someone around us receiving preference, when we fear that someone will get a leg up on us, when we fear someone will overtake us and we will not have the clout, the power, or the prestige we believe that we deserve. A pastor who happens to be president of Princeton Seminary Craig Barnes tells this story. He was doing a wedding early in his ministry. The groom was this burly guy, this really muscular lineman for his college, 
football team. The groom had spent years going nose to nose with opponents on the field. But now, he was standing at the altar with his petite bride reciting marital vows. And he said most of the traditional things like in sickness and in health. But then he added a clause no one saw coming. And I will always be gentle with you. The pastor started to tear up. Like many uh, of clergy who have been a pastor officiating at hundreds of weddings over 36 years, Craig Barnes said that is the only time he ever heard that phrase once in his exchange in leading couples through their vows. He writes, quote, Blessedly, that additional vow came early in my service to the church. Since then, it has inspired my understanding of how Christians should face each other in gentleness. We tend to think of gentleness as a weak or fragile thing, but as a virtue, it arises from strength, from strong people who choose to honor the sacredness of their relationships. Gentleness. Gentleness, however, is difficult when we allow fear to overwhelm us. Grace G. Sun Kim, a professor, Korean-American, who wrote Embracing the Other, the Transformative Spirit of Love, tells about her childhood fears, most of which she outgrew, except for one. She was taught that North Koreans, and she's a South Korean American, North Koreans are evil and inhumane. Dr. Kim learned they should not even be regarded as human beings. South Koreans called them commies. She learned by osmosis to fear North Koreans and anyone from North Korea. Fast forward then, she's an adult, she's a professor to 2014, and Dr. Kim was enlisted to work for the release of Kenneth Bay, a Korean-American who is being held prisoner in North Korea. They secured a meeting with the North Korean ambassador to the United Nations to have this meeting, and, and she was excited at first, just initial thrill to know they might be helping. But then the fear of North Koreans that had been instilled in her as a child surfaced. It was an irrational fear, based on the enduring perception that North Koreans are evil people and they will come to get me. In fact, before the meeting, Dr. Kim said she was hyperventilating, fearing the worst. And then she saw the ambassador, their eyes met, and the imagined terrors that had been circulating in her head subsided. And as she looked at the ambassador, Dr. Kim recognized that whether they were enemies, neighbors, or friends, they were all created in the image of God. No longer anchored by the dark weight of their preconceptions of each other in the task at hand, they talked affably and sincerely about North Korea and its people as well as Kenneth Bay, the prisoner. They even laughed together. Throughout the meeting, Dr. Kim kept asking herself, why was I afraid? Why was I afraid? Brothers and sisters, there are a lot of fears these days, and we've seen many during this past year still in the midst of them. You know, when some say black lives matter, others get angry. But I suspect fear is near the surface. When some hear the words defund the police, which is an unfortunate phrase that really should mean that we are finding other ways to help empower our police, others get angry. They hear it and are really afraid for their safety because they think it means no police and that we'll be left vulnerable and unprotected. Of course, we should be afraid of that. 
when some hear law and order. They fear an absence of freedoms and rights. When some hear the word lockdown, as we've heard quite a bit during this pandemic, they fear economic hardship and collapse. We are triggered by words that come from people who are made in the image of God too. Dr. Kim, the South Korean theologian, writes, peace won't come if we remain afraid. It's hard to overcome the kind of prejudice and cultural bigotry that perpetuates a vicious cycle of fear and hatred across generations. We are our brother's keeper. A friend gave me a book for Christmas a few years ago with anecdotes about Pope Francis. I like this Pope. I like him a lot. Now, he's not the head of my church, but I like him a lot. And one of the chapters is called, D is for Do Not Be Afraid. The writer says that Pope Francis believes, quote, we should not be afraid of goodness or better tenderness, of tenderness when it comes to neighbor. In other words, we must not be afraid to lower our defenses. Brothers and sisters, God expects more than, than dialogue with others. God and Jesus expects embrace. Now, I know that's hard right now. Keep your mask on. <laughs> embrace, fully embracing in each and every person the image of God. To overcome our fear of losing our status or our privilege or identity, we must do the counterintuitive. We must embrace and love, no matter how hard those different from us, on all parts of the spectrum. And yes, that means whatever the difference is. And, you know, we know there's race and class and gender. There's the NRA guy. There's the climate change activist the gay couple, or that other political party, whichever is yours. But here's the reality for Christians. For Christians, we can't build walls around our hearts and still be Jesus people. Shane Claiborne is a Christian activist from, I believe, Philadelphia. He has written numerous books. Um, he tweeted a photo a few years ago around the holidays of a nativity scene that he purchased in Bethlehem. Of course, we know what happens in Bethlehem. There's strife in the Middle East, Palestinian, Israeli. The Palestinians occupy large areas of Bethlehem. His nativity shows a pronounced wall around the Holy Family in this picture. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, yep. Yet we church people must confess that we too have often tried to keep Jesus from others by declaring who has access to Jesus and by separating ourselves from folks not like us. Somehow thinking that Jesus belongs only to us. We have been afraid of brothers and sisters. Not like us. Spear and breath, Cain and Abel. In his book, Fear of the Other, Will Williman, who I absolutely love, his preaching and his teaching and books are wonderful. I highly recommend you buy them and study them. Will Williman is at Duke. Um, he was a former Methodist bishop, but he tells how in this book, how he was ending a very busy Thursday afternoon, and he was leaving the church office, and he encountered a, a shuffling, forlorn older man. Of course, the man was down on his luck, homeless. He said to the bishop, could you, could you help me get some food? Food my foot, thought Willman. I'm sure you'll use the $20 that I give you just to get rid of you to buy booze. So the former bishop decided, oh, well, what the heck, gave him a 20. 
man said, I guess you expect me to thank you. He was on his way down the sidewalk with Williman's money. Well, a thank you would be nice, said the bishop. Well, I ain't, he muttered. Jesus made you help me. You'd have never done it on your own. <laughs> That's right. We don't love on our own. Not very well. We love because Jesus makes us love. Requires us to love. Tells us to lay down our lives in love. And there's only one way we have the ability, brothers and sisters, to love bravely our, our neighbors who are not like us. I'm going to go to Paul for a minute. Paul said it so well in Galatians. So I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. And when we allow Christ to take up residence in our lives, we walk away from Cain's anger and from our anger and from our resentments and our fear. Fear underlies anger and resentment. We're afraid. Yes, yes, we will always be tempted to say through the mouthpiece of fear, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I didn't sign up for loving people like you. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And I did. We signed up to be God's family, and we really did ask God to make us family. As Jesus prayed to the Father in John before he died, make them one. Make them family. Show us we are related, brother and sister, all of us. For God so loved the world, the whole world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Friends, we are not closed. We very much are, are open. No, we're not having in-person worship, and we bring you this online service. But please know that this church would love to be a place where you can share in community and where we are still learning to love one another, as Jesus asked us to do. It's hard. That's why it takes community and accountability. But we would love for you to be a part of this family of faith. You can connect with me through winfieldumc.com. Leave me a note, and I'd be glad to talk with you. Brothers and sisters, let us sing our closing hymn.
Go forth and love God and your neighbor in all that you do. Bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ so that those who do not know that love will find in each and every one of us most treasured and generous friends. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you. 